Hello everyone, my name is Michelle Angelo Rocha and I'm a PhD candidate in Educational Leadership and Policy Studies at the University of South Florida. The following video is a shot that was recorded at the International Congress of Qualitative Inquiry ICQY 2021. And this is the third video of four sections. So in case you didn't have time yet, yet to check it out the first and second videos, so go to our YouTube channel and check it out. This project was organized by the editors of the book Analyzing Interpreting Qualitative Research at the interview Dr. Charles Vanover, Paul Mijas, and Johnny Saldanian, and published by SAGE. In this third section, you will learn about strategies for coding and categorizing data after the interview. You're going to watch three sections. The first section is Coding System Design and Management for Remote Collaboration with Dr. Danielle Tuner from Quickos. And the second presentation is Deductive and Inductive Approaches to Qualitative Data Analysis with Dr. Andrea Birman from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and Patricia Wichwoski from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And the last presentation is Analyzing and Coding Interviews and Focus Groups Considering Cross Cultural, cultural and cross-language data with Dr. Elsa Gonzalez from the University of Houston and Yona Lincoln from Texas A&M University. And the discussant is Dr. Cynthia Lubin. She will enjoy the panelists in the end for the concluding discussions. So get comfortable and check out our section three. And if you didn't have time yet, go there and check on your Tubi channel, the, the section one and section two. Because we're, we're still in a pandemic year, we wanted to talk about, about um, how you can manage um, collaborative coding when you're working remotely, um, because that's something that suddenly a lot of people are, are trying to do. First of all, why do we do coding? So when we're working with qualitative data, there's this fantastic richness, but there's this also fantastic complexity. And trying to have some kind of process that helps us manage and understand that data is really important. Coding is one way that we can do that, and it's a very commonly utilized way. And it, it, it's something that if you supervise a lot of students, you see quite a lot. Coding systems can quite easily get out of hand themselves. So coding systems can become very large. They can be very ungainly, they can also become unstructured themselves. It's important to have a, a method to kind of think about how we're going to manage the coding system and to keep track of things like metadata. And I'll talk a bit that, about this in a minute, which helps us kind of manage those, those codes and, and the whole coding journey. Although this sounds like a really kind of, I don't know, like a really pedantic kind of um, really boring uh, process oriented talk, I just want to say that the aim of this is, is something actually quite beautiful, and that's to make sure that the codes don't get in the way of you understanding the data. In my view, the coding process should always help you facilitate a creative process. So it should allow you to be as engaged with your data as you can possibly be, so that you can try lots of different ways of exploring and analyze it, lots of different types of coding, and then you can find um, a really creative, innovative way to talk about and describe your qualitative data. It's hard enough to manage coding systems when it's just you working on them. But when you start doing that as part of a process with other people, this creates a lot of extra challenges. Uh, and yeah, so um, Charles is talking about herding cats just now. And it's kind of similar when you do collaborative coding, I think. You have to manage uh, the people who are working on the project. You have to do that anyway, but when you're doing it with coding, you have to do it in a very specific way. When we're working with qualitative data, you have to do it in a very specific way. And you also need to make sure that you've got a system that's been designed from the start to work with uh, a group of people. But why would we collaborate for analysis? I mean, a lot of people don't do coding of qualitative data. A lot of pay people um, don't do collaborative analysis. It's usually something, especially for small projects, that tends to be a very kind of individual journey. Uh, it's something that people do themselves. They kind of bury themselves away um, for months at a time, and then they they come out blaring into the sunshine, hopefully with a beautiful coding framework um, and, and some answers to their research questions. But collaboration can actually be very useful. It can share the workload. So when you've got lots of different people um, working on a project uh, and you've got quite a large data set, um, then you can share things. So 
people could work on a certain number of sources at one time. People could look for particular themes. Um, you can also use it to improve the, the quality of the process. Um, and by what that I mean is you, you could do things like validation. So quite a lot of people, especially if they're working for kind of uh, organizations and government agencies that are a little bit kind of skeptical about so, certain types of qualitative um, analysis and interpretation, you can have uh, multiple people kind of uh, review the codes, uh, do blind coding, um, and see what level of integrated reliability you get. But you can also use collaborative analysis to teach and learn. And I'm kind of really interested in this at the moment because a lot of people talk about qualitative coding and qualitative analysis being a bit of a black box. And I think one of the best ways to get around that is to actually show someone, show students the process as you go through doing coding analysis. And of course, the best way to learn is to do. So being able to collaborate on a qualitative data project, I think is an invaluable opportunity for students. Um, and it's really challenging for, for the teachers as well sometimes. So with kind of like a year into this pandemic really kicking off, um, and it's something that I've been trying to help a lot of groups of people do. I mean, mostly kind of users of Quercos. So that's the, the qualitative software that I designed. But, but what we found is that suddenly people were having to collaborate remotely. They hadn't planned to do that. And they're suddenly realizing that collaboration is actually very difficult to do. Um, and it's very difficult to do remotely when you can't get in the office together. You can't have a chat over a whiteboard or a giant, you know, like a flip chart with lots of pens and paper. Um, and it's something that for a lot of people was was an element that was kind of uh, kind of tacked on at the last minute because of the the uh, covid restrictions so um it, it has been a challenge but something that that i hope i've kind of got a few pointers now about the best ways to kind of go through and do this when i talk about kind of the management process what am i actually talking about here so there's a couple of different elements so the first here is managing the data itself so those are actually your kind of your sources of qualitative data so what are you going to share are you going to share the complete transcripts just extracts of them are you going to share the whole data set or are certain people going to look at just certain sources who's going to be able to see what aspects are you going to make sure that things are anonymized before you share them um, will people be able to see other documents other sources even if it's kind of you know not their official role to be coding those um, and then inevitably when we're working, especially if we're working with transcripts, there'll often be uh, typos, there'll be misheard things. Um, what do we do about corrections and edit? Bearing in mind that changing the data at the stage where it's already been shared is going to change things for everyone else. So either we need to kind of uh, check the data very carefully before we share it, or we need to have a process about what happens when we need to change the data. Then there's also the codes, the coding framework itself. So how do we share that? So a lot of it depends what kind of analytical approach you're taking. Um, and if you're doing framework analysis, then, OK, that, that tends to be relatively easy to manage. You can set your coding framework ahead of time uh, and you can uh, a very structured process. Um, you can discuss it all together. And then that's your kind of fixed in concrete kind of uh, coding strategy. You're going to use those codes. You've described how you're going to use those codes and off you go. If you're using something like grounded theory or more inductive methods where each of the different researchers is going to be suggesting new codes as you go along, it becomes a lot more complicated. I think it's worth it, but you just need to think about in ahead how that's going to be managed. So, for example, I've got this example on the screen here. So we somebody may have created a code called negative. Other people may have created one called bad or disadvantage. Are those the same things? Can we move them together? Those are the kind of discussions which you need to have. And again, you need to have a kind of strategy for deciding uh, when you're going to review the codes, what you're going to do with differences. Um, and I'll come back a little bit to the differences in a second. But again, you need to kind of have a plan ahead of time, uh, mostly to kind of manage the people. So when you've got this coding framework that you're sharing or, or when you're sharing as you, you go on and you're creating codes, you need to have a bit more of this metadata, so information about the data. So a code book is a very common kind of way to do this, and it needs to be very clear. You need to have examples for what codes mean. So what does negative mean? Uh, is that used for anything that's negative? Um, is that just kind of negative emotions, negative feelings, uh, negative statements? Um, you need to have a longer description to, to describe exactly what you mean by that code. And you need to have examples so you can tell um, when you should and when you should be use, shouldn't be using that code. You should be using a different code, uh, like disadvantage. And you also need to have a process where at least one person in the project is kind of checking on that as they go along, um, updating the coding framework and looking to see um, whether any of those guidelines need to be modified. 
I'm also a big fan of um, meta codes. So codes that are not necessarily specifically about the data, but, but about the process um, and things that will help us write up. So I always have a code for key quotes so that when somebody says something that just jumps out the page at me and I know I want to quote in my paper, I've got that in a separate category. So it's a lot easier to find. I also am really interested to have codes which are which um, highlight contradictions, uh, either for an individual or between individuals, because those are always interesting things to talk about in the dis dis discussion session when we start writing up. Um, and then we also want to kind of think about categories and groups for our codes. If we're doing a couple of different types of analysis, um, does that mean that we're going to look at um, different uh, strategies like maybe discourse analysis and thematic analysis, well, we need to tag those in some way so that we've got our different approaches uh, logged and tagged in some way. So software can help with this process and it doesn't have to be qualitative analysis software. A lot of people use Word and Excel, especially something like Google Docs or Office 365 is great for collaboration because everybody can work on it at once. Uh, traditional qualitative software can help a lot as well. And there's also cloud qualitative software and that gives you those the kind of advantages that you get with Office 365 and so on, where everybody can be working on one document at the same time. What we're looking at in, the, in a management system within the software is something that will help you track those codes, your coding and the process. So you need to kind of be logging within the software, however you're using it or whatever your management system is, um, the process you went through and changes and decisions that you made. It doesn't have to be digital. It can just be a notebook, but it just needs to be a consistent process to, to help, help you uh, write things up. So when you're working with software as a team, um, we have to think about um, the different issues that that would have. So one of those is access. Does everybody have access to the same software? Does everybody have access to a computer? Does everybody have access to reliable internet? Um, is everybody going to be working on uh, Windows or have you got Mac users? Um, are you using a software tool that supports the RefuQDA Exchange standard, which means everyone can work together? You also need to thought, think about where you're going to save the data. Are you going to have something like a shared drive? Are you going to email the project files to each other? Um, this is a very important thing to think about, especially when working with the traditional um, qualitative software. So these file-based access issues, you know, where are you going to store things? How are you going to share things? You have to consider where you're going to save the file, um, if you're going to have um, templates which you merge together, if everybody's working on project files separately, or whether you've got individual files shared together, and how you're going to merge files together, and, and how frequently you're going to do that. There's also issues here, let's see if this is going to work now, cloud-based access. So there's a lot of other qualitative software which allows you to store in the cloud, and when you're working with, with things like Dropbox and OneDrive and so on. So this also allows you to work with individual projects that you can merge together, but you can also use it for live collaboration. So you can also work all together at the same time. You have sequ sequential or concurrent access, um, and you can manage the user positions, but it's not a panacea. So these cloud platforms don't solve all of your problems yourself. You still need to have that management process of what you're going to do with the data. Um, and it means that there are other cost considerations, often kind of things like ongoing subscriptions. Um, my general guidelines for teamwork would be make sure that you've got a good process for describing what you're going to code and how, which sources and projects you want to work on, and the timescales. Everybody needs to know when the deadlines are going to be. Um, make sure you've got some process for meetings, uh, what you're going to discuss, and how you're going to um, talk about and resolve any issues. Practically, these days, collaboration means a lot more remote working. And so that means you need to have clearer communication channels. And they can be very easily things like Zoom and Skype or just email and, and chat and things like that. But try and make sure during that process that you're recording the process of that as well as just the outcome. And this is something I wanted to come back to that there's, there's often a sense in collaboration that the aim is to get everybody on the same page and everybody interpreting the data in the same way. And I don't think that that's the best way to work with qualitative data. I think the best way is to, to look at what's different, use that to spark debate and discussions, um, and make sure you've got something in your process for, for recording those discussions because they usually be very interesting and revealing about the data. Finally, there are ethical considerations as well. So, um, do participants know that lots of people are going to see their data? You need to make sure that this has been described ahead of time. Uh, are your IRB or ethics board happy with how you're sharing the data and how many people are going to be working on it? And are there data protection issues, especially where, where the data is going to be stored and located? So Quercos now has a cloud subscription service and that allows people to work uh, collaboratively. Um, but there are also lots of other tools as well. So Deduce, Atlas TI, Cloud is quite new. Uh, WebQDA, Dell, Transat and Taget all have ways that allow you to collaborate with data online.
Um, so there's a lot more about this in the, the, the chapter in the textbook. There's also a blog on our website now, which discusses the chapter and promotes the chapter. And there's a video talking about the chapter as well. So uh, we're now in kind of like four degrees of, of promotion for the chapter. Uh, so sorry for the technical issues. Sorry that was a bit rushed at the end. But um, th thank you very much. And do email me if you've got um, any other questions that don't come up uh, in the discussion. Thank you so much. Now we're going to hear deductive and inductive approaches to qualitative data analysis with Andrea Birma and Dr. Patricia Wichkowski. Hi, everybody. Um, I am Andrea Bingham. Um, my co-presenter, Dr. Patricia Wolkowski, is not here today, so I'll be taking over for both of us. I am an associate professor at the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, and today I am going to be presenting on our book chapter that outlines a five-cycle process of qualitative data analysis, uh, integrating deductive and inductive approaches. So the purpose of this presentation and the book chapter on which it's based is to explore the distinctions between deductive and inductive analysis processes and offer some guidance around how to analyze data in a way that addresses the tension between the strength of qualitative analysis, so it's focused on emergent issues, and applying theoretical framing and existing knowledge to the data. So first, let's just talk a little bit about what we mean by deductive and inductive analysis. Uh, deductive or a priori coding involves a process of creating codes prior to data analysis and applying those codes to the, to the data as you read. So those codes might be organizational codes or they may be developed from the literature or from theory. Um, inductive analysis is the kind of analysis that appears in most qualitative studies, and it absolutely should be. Um, it's the key strength of qualitative work. Inductive analysis involves reading through the data and identifying and naming concepts as they emerge. It can be used for meaning making, developing findings, um, and evidence generation, so pulling out representative quotes, quotes in support of findings. Inductive analysis is messier than deductive analysis because Inductive practices go beyond sorting and require the researcher to kind of pull out what's happening in the data and allow the data to speak to them. So the data analysis process I'm presenting on today consists of five cycles that engage both deductive and inductive strategies. So in the first two cycles, deductive coding is used to sort data into organizational categories such as data type, participant, or time period and organize data into categories to maintain alignment with research questions. So um, then on to the third and fourth cycles, inductive, inductive coding practices are used to make meaning from the data, develop codes, themes, and findings, uh, and identify representative data to support those findings. And then finally, in that fifth cycle, we draw on both inductive and deductive strategies to apply theoretical or conceptual frameworks and situate the findings in the existing literature. So throughout this presentation, as I dig a little bit further into each of these cycles, I use excerpts from a qualitative case study of um, the implementation and development of a high-tech personalized learning school in order to illustrate the analysis process and discuss kind of my decision-making process um, as I was doing analysis. So in this study, I used activity theory or cultural historical activity theory as my theoretical framework, which helped me look at uh, the many interacting factors that affect how individuals learn and how organizations, in this case a school, uh, change. So with the large amount of data that qualitative work often produces, it's really important to have some strong organizational practices in place. So the first two cycles, which are deductive in nature, help with data organization. The first cycle of analysis entails attribute coding using categories like data type, participant, and time period, which makes it easier to keep track of the data and identify the sources of evidence. The second cycle of coding involves reading the data more carefully and then sorting it into deductive codes aligned to broad topical categories of interest that are based on your research questions. This really helps to maintain focus and identify pertinent data to facilitate subsequent cycles of inductive analysis. Um, memoing during these cycles can include thoughts on data collection and analysis, creating an audit trail, and initial impressions. So this excerpt from Field Notes shows how codes were applied in my study in the first and second cycles of analysis. Um, this entire excerpt was coded with the attribute codes classroom observation, Ms. L, who was the participant whose class I was observing in this case, and then fall 2014, which was the time period. Um, in the second cycle, research question codes were also applied, which included um, personalization and change uh, among many other codes. 
So these first two cycles helped me to organize the data, refamiliarize myself with the data, and begin to form some overall impressions. So although applying attribute codes can sometimes be a little bit tedious, that process helped me track where my eventual evidence came from. Um, these cycles ultimately allowed me to examine the data that was cross-coded as well when I was interested in conceptual intersections. So for example, I was able to examine data that was cross-coded as change and personalization, which in later rounds of analysis helped me to see how practices evolved. If ideas about potential themes or categories begin to develop in these cycles or overall patterns, you start to notice those, creating a memo to record those thoughts is useful. Um, then in the third round of coding, which involves inductive analysis, the researcher can determine whether those ideas actually fully emerge. So in the third and fourth cycles of coding, I followed an inductive process. So having sorted the data into categories aligned to my research questions in the previous round, I maintained focus on those research questions by then inductively analyzing the data by each category. So I began with open coding, in which I reviewed the data within the categories applied in the first and second cycles of categorizing. Uh, the first and second cycles of coding, um, I ran through the data in each category, creating and applying codes um, and identifying emerging topics or concepts as I read. In the fourth cycle, I reviewed that coded data again, looking for patterns across and within the data sources. So I used pattern coding, which is a process of condensing the codes created during open coding to kind of chunk that data into fewer analytic concepts. So this data excerpt demonstrates the codes applied and created during these cycles. So for example, in the third cycle, the in vivo codes time structures here and student focused here emerged in this process, um, as did the codes disciplinary practices, technological challenges, classroom management issues, and no excuses, which was the disciplinary system engaged at the school. In the fourth cycle, I engaged in pattern coding to condense some of those open codes into fewer analytic pieces. So for example, the codes disciplinary practices and no excuses were condensed into the pattern code disciplinary practices related to no excuses. So this process of condensing the codes developed during open coding into patterns helped me to really start to summarize what I was seeing in the data. And the fourth cycle also involved um, quite a bit of memoing to begin to identify themes from those pattern codes. So the themes emerged from condensing the patterns I had identified in the data into a series of key concepts. And this is what that looked like. So for example, the open code personalized practices also became a pattern code as it was both a pattern seen throughout the data and it was the conceptual glue that kind of helped tie together incidents across the data. When I looked at the data coded as both personalized practices and technology use, I was able to see the theme technology facilitated personalized practices. I then developed findings from the themes by condensing and rewording the themes into short phrases that clearly answered the research questions. So the themes technology facilitated personalized practices, disciplinary practices uh, related to no excuses here, and digital resources as classroom management tools became the finding here. The no excuses model was used to control technology use and facilitate personalized learning practices. Um, this analysis cycle allowed me to distill the codes and patterns into themes and then into findings that directly answered my research questions. So then finally, I engaged in one last cycle of coding where I combined deductive and inductive processes. So in this cycle, I reanalyzed the data as it was sorted from my round of inductive analysis using codes developed from the theoretical framework, activity theory, and from the literature. And beyond applying these codes, um, situating findings in the literature and using the theoretical framework analytically in order to explain my findings required some additional work. Um, so to facilitate this, I engaged in a process of analytic questioning. And that involves memoing in response to deeper questions about the data in relation to existing research and to activity theory of the framework. So questions I asked myself in these memos included these here. What did the teacher interviews tell me about how the school evolved? What what do these findings mean in context? How are they related to the larger existing literature base? And what can we learn from these findings? So this final cycle of analysis and this analytic questioning really pushed my thinking around what the findings meant in the larger sense. This cycle was the most difficult process of the uh, most difficult part of the analysis process. It involved applying theoretical concepts and interpreting how my findings exemplified and diverged from those concepts. But this part of the analysis facilitated explaining why 
things were happening as they did. So I was able to answer my second research question and to expand upon my findings to discuss implications of the school's development and evolution for other schools implementing a personalized learning school model, which was my third research question. Um, and although a researcher could certainly justify using theory-based deductive coding earlier in the process, I just found that this worked better for me. I was better able to engage in the inductive process of analysis without first imposing those theoretical concepts on the data. But of course, this round of coding wasn't purely deductive. As I said, while I read, I also developed short phrases that connected my inductive findings with theory and existing literature. So for example, disciplinary practices this uh, explanation of finding here, disciplinary practices, which were the rules of the activity system, and digital resources, which were the tools of the activity system, uh, mediated whether and how personalized learning was achieved. Uh, that became the theory-based explanation for this finding here. The no excuses model was used to control technology use and facilitate personalized learning practices. So this explanation was created by sorting the inductively developed findings into theory-aligned deductive codes and categories. Um, and those codes on the previous slide, activity theory rules and activity theory mediating tools and artifacts. Um, and then using some of that analytic question to, questioning to make sense of the findings through the lens of theory. So drawing on um, and balancing appropriate analysis practices is critical to conducting rigorous qualitative research. Integrating deductive and inductive approaches can help the researcher focus on the research pur purpose, as well as the paradigmatic theoretical and conceptual lenses. Um, in our chapter, we argue that deductive practices can help with organization and focus. Uh, however, the purpose of qualitative research is to understand experiences and perceptions of phenomena and context. If research researchers don't allow the data to speak to them through inductive approaches, they risk just imposing their own experiences and perceptions on the data and the participants, rather than allowing the answers to come from the participants' words and actions. So our recommendation in the chapter is for researchers to use both deductive and inductive analysis processes um, together, but to ensure that there's clarity around how and why and when these practices are being used. Um, analytic clarity can be produced by using clearly defined a priori codes, employing consistent inductive analysis within and across deductive codes and categories, and engaging in a syst systematic process of memoing. Um, these practices allow qualitative researchers to organize the data, maintain focus on the research questions, allow um, themes and findings to emerge, engage in theoretical analysis, and ensure trustworthiness. So ultimately, qualitative researchers should draw on the strengths of deductive analytic practices and then lean into the opportunities provided by inductive analytic strategies. And that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk. Now we are going to hear about analyzing and code interviews and focus groups considering cross-cultural land, cross-language data with Elsa Gonzalez from the University of Houston and Yona Lincoln from Texas A&M University. Well, thank you and welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Elsa Gonzalez. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Houston. And professor, my colleague, Professor Ivana Lincoln, she's a university distinguished professor of higher education emerita at Texas A&M University. And we are so glad that you are joining us this morning to share with us our work on analyzing and coding interviews and focus group considering cross-cultural and cross-language data. As our previous uh, colleagues and presenters, this is the uh, this is the uh, the chapter to, uh, twelve of the book that we are introducing to you. Our work is uh, is part of this chapter, and we are very happy to join all our co-authors. The beginning um, there is always a beginning, and uh, we wanna share with you that considering the premise that there is no formula to translating culture. Uh, collecting data in the native language and then presenting the analysis as second language, primary English, these cross-cultural worlds become an important, if complex, issue to unpack. And that's what we want to share with you, our experience on that. Analyzing data and presenting findings are a huge endeavor for any researcher who hopes to make certain that the local reader understand and make sense of the data from local participants and foreign researchers. The process involves a translation of the language with a deep understanding of the context that will help the researcher and ultimately the reader to understand better the phenomenon. 
This chapter, this work, looks to present strategies to address the analysis of data with a cross-cultural and cross-language origin using a content analysis and a constant comparative analysis as analytical practices. And now there is a study behind this work and um, my colleague and friend, Dr. Lincoln, is uh, gonna share with us a little bit of that. This, this comes from a uh, work on ELSA's dissertation, which uh, the field work was accomplished in Mexico. Uh, ELSA is originally from Mexico. And uh, she went down there to study the processes that the universities were uh, considering for moving into the 20th century effectively and for leadership training for the 21st century university. And so our roles were, she was the dissertation researcher and I was the main advisor. So uh, we had to evolve a certain methodological approach because I'm not a native Spanish speaker. And so what we had were essentially two sets of interviews. We had the interviews that were originally done in Spanish and which were uh, prepared to go back to the interviewees so that they could read them over and say, you know, did we get it right or did we not get it right? And then the interviews that were translated into English for a presentation to the doctoral dissertation committee. Now, there was a problem with the translation because there were things, obviously, cultural statements, cultural understandings, cultural context, and idioms that didn't move comfortably or easily. We were very, very fortunate in that uh, we had a colleague who had been raised as the child of missionaries in Mexico, and who was fully bilingual. So he agreed to help us out with translating and preserving the meaning, if not the words, of various aspects of the cultural context or even of idioms. So we were um, very, very lucky to have him. This person often served the university uh, when the university was creating memoranda of understanding, uh, for instance, with other universities in Central and South America uh, that were Spanish-speaking countries. Uh, he was enormously helpful. But, but we had a problem in trying to preserve the cultural complex and the cultural understandings that came with uh, Mexican universities that were very different from U.S. universities. So we uh, evolved this methodological approach uh, where we created, in effect, Elsa created a partially bilingual dissertation. Now, ultimately, that dissertation was shared in primarily Spanish with the people who gave the initial interviews for the sake of the dissertation committee, we created a partially bilingual text so that the original words in Spanish were preserved, but the meaning for the cultural context for, the, for a cultural translation or for an idiom was also presented at the same time in the findings chapter. I, it was a very, very interesting dissertation for me because I could see the words and then I could see the words in English. So we had a dissertation that tried to speak to two different audiences. We want to share this part of the of the experience because 20 years ago, uh, we as an author, we sought to have this conversation about what researchers do when they have a data in another language that is not English and in that case, Spanish, and then how we right. present it to our, uh, to our readers, to our audience, and our different audiences. That's, that's the other situation. We have an audience, the local audience, that is the dissertation committee and other uh, people, in the, and an English speaker, but also we have the locals um, back in Mexico, and that means, uh, in this case, the primary are the administrators. And thanks, as uh, uh, Ivona mentioned, the, our colleague, he served as a 
Biona as a peer debriefer, uh, as really as a translator and as a cult uh, cultural translator that uh, along in between my understanding and, uh, and serving in all this process of uh, translating not just the language, but the culture that is so important to present it for, for the audience. I want to also mention here that our early work uh, that we have uh, we have also uh, presented in the past support this type of cross-cultural and cross-language data analysis and outline five ways in which Western scholars might aid in the colonizing methodology and research through the analysis of cross-cultural and cross-language data. These five strategies um, going from addressing working bilingual data and the consideration of translation and the translators, that is so important factor here, consider non-Western cultural traditions, uh, consider multiple perspectives in text from the local to the readers, including multivocal and multilingual text, and including rich uh, discussions of technical issues uh, to ensure accessibility and publications. And, we are, um, we are not sharing all the, uh, what we have in the chapter, but uh, we, we have more, I mean, more details in the chapters and from our previous work. At this moment in time, there's something else that we wanna add. We will add another step toward decolonization. And that is a frank and full discussion of ethical issues encountered in such cross-cultural cross-language uh, work, uh, including perhaps issues around yeah. negotiation with publication outlets. Uh, some of which may find such texts daunting of even unpublishable. I have come to see this <laughs> not just as an issue of trying to preserve some of the cultures that are non-U.S. traditions, but as a, as a question of social justice. Do we, as Shula Reinhardt's, come in and rip off data and leave, or do we give something back? To me, this is and to Elsa, I think also, this is a social justice issue. Are we, in fact, making fair payment for the knowledge that we take? Are we giving knowledge back in such a way that it is useful to the people who are there on site? I, I think what we are sharing here is a process that started 20 years ago. These conversations that uh, Dr. Lincoln and I we have had since we encountered these methodological um, decisions, but also based, and that's why uh, early work is on the colonizing methodologies, because we have a really um, a, a deep conversations of social justice, getting back to the communities, and, and uh, how to preserve that as we present our data and present it back to, to the local uh, community. Uh, in, in this case, our, our local audience. Uh, cultural familiarity and cultural sensitivity and cultural understanding is what serves as a framework for the analysis of cross-language and cross-cultural data. So what we want to share uh, now is a little bit of the process that uh, also uh, Ivona described at the beginning as we were collecting and as I was collecting data back in Mexico in three different field trips. Uh, data analysis interact continually with the data collection, as we all know. And after the first interview was collected and analyzed, it, preliminary findings were used to guide the collection of data from the next participant. During the development of this study, the perception and experience of each participant was crucial and the detecting, building future scenarios that allow the researcher, and in this case the researcher, to organize competencies by different criteria. Therefore, the use of content analysis and constant comparative uh, was, um, was so important in, finding, in, in those findings that it was necessary to illustrate those findings. First, as we, um, as Ivana described, I interviewed uh, the participants in Spanish that was transcribed for the tapes into computer files. Then second, the transcript for broken into units of data or the smallest fragment of data that from which meaning could be obtained. And unit testing <coughs> data and the, uh, are the crucial step in transforming interview data into the smallest uh, pieces of information as we understand in the context. Third, the units were, uh, at, at this moment, still all the, un the transcript and the units were in Spanish. The units were identified by source of information, site, participant, uh, date, and gender. We have all these different um, identifiers of the sources of the data. 
then the text uh, units on the transcript were printed in cards in two different colors. One of the things that we want to identify, I want to identify was the difference between public and private universities and public and private um, administrators from, and leaders from those universities. So we have also uh, color coding in, those, um, in, that, in that analysis. Units were, as I mentioned, units were kept in Spanish in order to maintain the original language and continuity in each narrative made by the participants. Additionally, this procedure was used with the purpose of keeping the richness of the data in Spanish. For the presentation of data, then, units are in several cases presented in both, in both languages. Actually, in all the cases, this dissertation was the first one in, in, in Texas A&M presented um, in a, with English and in Spanish, when a different language than English. We, uh, if you, we see the dissertation, you can see uh, all the data that we were uh, illustrating and uh, supporting the findings in both languages. Um, this procedure supported, again, the idea that the Spanish-speaking reader understand the exact meaning of the unit and its context, which some uh, uh, many, several times is so difficult to translate the context. And that was one of the uh, one of the issues and one of the uh, great, uh, great contributions of this collaboration with our peer debriefer our colleague and uh, and also through these dis discussions and um, and decisions that we have uh, between um, Ivona, uh, our colleague, and myself. Uh, the researcher, um, based on the analysis of data and the contribution of the peer debriefer, as I mentioned, identif we identify relevant themes. Uh, and patterns are covered during the, the unitization process. Beginning at this point, the analysis, we were presenting findings, the analysis of data start being presented in English. At this point, the name of the codes and then the identified themes were defined in English and research memos that include interpretation, findings and conclusions were presented in English, along with the units, meaning in Spanish that support the findings. Those units were introduced in the text, as I mentioned, in English and in Spanish, as we consider further audiences, where other critical stakeholders from the local country where data was collected. One of the um, almost final thoughts that we wanna, I want to share here is the word that Ansaldúa uh, and the influence that Ansaldúa has in this study. Ansaldúa in her social studies about Mexico and the U.S. border insists in the presenting her analysis in Spanish, in English, and in many cases as a mix of both languages. This conveys the social phenomena of two cultures bordering each other, the reader to understand the language of the border, where bilingual texts and the social construction they represent exhibit a great power. We would like to get back to a final thought about the importance of local users that also uh, Ivona mentioned in the beginning. One of the things that we, um, that we thought about as we looked at the data is some of these people who were interviewees were really quite visionary about what Mexican universities would need to do to move very forcefully into the 21st century and keep up with the technology, uh, as it, particularly as it linked the learning and the, and the later life um, occupations of their students. And so we, we came to a kind of new understanding of the importance of local users. And it became very, very clear to us that we needed to feed back into Mexico the findings that we had so that all of the uh, uh, interviewees could share the insights of some of the more uh, perspicacious of the of the interviewees, some of the people who were classify them as more visionary about what their own institutions would need and perhaps what other uh, institutions would need in Mexico in the coming decades. And so we had to figure a way to get back information to local users. And this fits very well with a sort of emerging consciousness on the part of many ethnographers and ethnomethodologists about the, the responsibilities that we have for local users in providing them the information that we have gathered back so that they can act on changes which they may need in their own context, may need or want. We have to uh, we have to consider the debt that we owe for the knowledge that they provide to us, for the understandings that they give us about their own culture. The insights that we have have to go back into the local context 
so that people can act on their own circumstances. It's a very Freudian notion. It's a sensible one. And it's time that probably as a profession, the West needs to see its obligation to the people from whom knowledge has been gleaned over the decades. So we felt a very strong sense of responsibility to the local users. And those were the people who provided us with some insight and vision and understanding of where their own institutions would need to move, particularly vis-a-vis women, as it turned out. But we recognized even more deeply the importance of local users. As we have shared with you, this was the evolving of years of conversations that we went from across language to across cultural, actually, understanding uh, of these local users and different uh, uh, different language, different cultures, as we also uh, encountered and start uh, analyzing and recognizing that this process happens from several uh, scholars international in different parts of the of different parts of the world as we present our data in English and as we present our data in different languages and in different cultures. Through recognizing and giving voice to these scholars and the actors around this process, we present uh, their hope of evading some of those hidden cultural assumptions that they found in the eye of different readers and instead expressing a full and deep understanding of the context and showing the richness of each culture and richness of this experience. Bringing together across time, space, and language local and non-local consumers of the research, we have intent to move people to a moral dimension, making them more able to present a critique that moves the reader and spectator towards social justice. Thank you. Now we have Paul Mihas. He will be our discussion. Thank you, um, Michelle. Um, I will make a, a few comments and then we can um, move to some questions. Daniel Turner's chapter uh, reinforces flexibility and qualitative analysis and trusting the process, the creative process, but also it reminds us of the need for rigor. Um, he also shows us how to use the software rather than having the software use us. I'm struck by the by the visual tools um, in, uh, in Quercos that uh, Daniel t- um, uh, shows us in his chapter and how software can help us get a, get, get a good view as Miles and Huberman and now Miles Huberman and, and Saldana told us from their very first edition. Really um, uh, appreciate Daniel's kind of putting software in the context of the larger, of our larger goals as qualitative researchers and the creative process. I will move on to um, Andrea Bingham and Patricia Witkowski's um, chapter. When I first uh, sat down to read Andrea and Patricia's chapter, the first thing that went through my mind is that I've been waiting for somebody to write this chapter. Uh, I work with uh, graduate students who are often confused by what to do with the combination of deductive and inductive topics in their work. Uh, what do they do first? How can they balance these different forms of coding with a theoretical framework? These are not um, easy things to juggle during the course of an entire study. You know, how can this process seem less random for uh, for researchers? So I will definitely point uh, students and other people to this chapter and send my quiet thanks to uh, Andrea and Patricia from now on. It was um, a real treat to um, hear uh, Elsa Gonzalez and Ivana Lincoln present today. Uh, their chapter on cross-cultural and cross-language data is another chapter that many of us have been waiting for. Uh, this presentation uh, reinforces our responsibilities as researchers to our interviewees and local communities and how knowledge production is for everyone, not just for us. I grew up in a bilingual household. My parents are from Greece, and I never really considered doing research with a Greek community because I wasn't sure how I, that I could communicate effectively Greek humor and figure language to an English-speaking audience, but this chapter shows me how this can be done. This chapter gives us cross-cultural analytic bridges to think about managing the logistics of cross-cultural research, as well as managing the different needs of the local culture and the receiving audience. So I thank Elsa and Ivana for their insightful and timely contribution. I guess um, my, my first question to the presenters is maybe uh, kind of sharing with us what you find that researchers get stuck, or wh- where, where do researchers get stuck in the process of analysis and interpretation, things that you've witnessed, uh, researchers that you've witnessed kind of struggling at, at a certain point or with a certain kind of practice. I wonder if you could um, perhaps address that. I get stuck when I have data and it's well analyzed and I've maybe memoed a lot of it and I say, oh, now where do I start writing? And even though I've written multiple memos, I say to myself, how do I tell this story? And I sit with my keyboard in front of me (laughs) and my screen out in front of me and, and it goes click, 
click, click, <laughs> little cursor, and I don't know where to start. And so I have to think that through. That's always a place for me where I run into a speed bump. I, I may be sailing quite along, and then once I have to put something down on paper, and it's past a memo, and now maybe it's a final report, I get stuck. I'm really slowed down. So for me, I think it's interesting because I, I teach intro and advanced like qualitative methods for PhD students. I see them getting stuck on the exact same things that I found myself getting stuck on and find myself getting stuck on. And writing this chapter for this book was actually extremely helpful for me. I hope it's helpful. I hope it's helpful for others as well. But it was really helpful for me in really thinking about the usefulness of theoretical frameworks and conceptual frameworks and how to use them and what that means and and not just you know being forced to use them as part of your dissertation work as you know or being forced to use them as part of what a journal would like you to do but how they can really push your understanding of what your actual findings are are saying and what that means in context and I think I struggled with I don't know if that was you, Charlie, or Paul, who said something about the black box of qualitative analysis. I have certainly struggled with what's what's happening in my own brain in that black box. And writing this chapter really helped like flush out like this is what I'm doing specifically. And with theoretical frameworks in particular, like what does that actually look like when I'm applying that and trying to make sense of my findings within that context? And so, yeah, so as much as I hope this book is helpful for others, and I'm sure it will be, especially based on what I've read so far and what I've heard today, I hope, I know that it was very helpful for me in writing it, just in kind of getting that out on paper. So uh, just mention uh, Andrea, is, um, and I would like to pick up on that, is the, the know-how uh, for many and as a student is like, yeah, but how I do it? I mean, how in the practice see, and on, on our case, uh, uh, in the, the cross culture, in the cross, uh, cross language uh, interpretation, how actually I see it? I mean, I have, uh, I talk in another language, I talk in another, in another culture than familiar, or I'm not familiar. So how actually do? So the, recogni uh, the recognition of those uh, steps and how to do it, uh, it could be the, the stock point uh, or the stock point for several people or several of our um, researchers who go out of the field and it's like how, how we can do it. And so as, um, as you shared, we hope that this work and, uh, and some of the different materials that are shared here, it could bring some light and some confidence to the process. Uh, uh, particularly, uh, I could find that also the role of the translator, uh, that it should be uh, more, uh, more than a translator, as we try to, to, uh, to describe in our experience, the role as a peer debriefer and or co-investigator in this process because it's so important when you are not familiar with the culture or the context that you are um, a researcher on. Um, so those are the little details here and there that in the practice, like, okay, how I sit and do it, how I put it in paper, how I talk about it. And we hope that this work uh, and start, I mean, a little bit clarifying the, and demystifying the, the process. Yeah, I think the, the only other thing that I'd add is that, um, yeah, it's, it's similar to what, what um, Ivana was talking about, that kind of making the jump to start writing up. After the coding, I think a lot of students get very excited by coding and they can get into it really well, um, but it can kind of become a bit of a mess and become a bit unstructured. And I think part of it is just coming back and remembering that the, the, the analysis process is not just there to help you understand the data, it's to help you communicate it. And so to, to think about how you can structure it and what kind of codes it can have that help you write up. And then like I gave the example of that key quotes code, and it just means that you've got something to start with. If you know that, that that's something the, that's, that you want to put in your, your write-up, you can start structuring things around that. And I think once you've made that first leap, once you've kind of like started writing that first paragraph from your data, like the rest tends to start to flow. But um, yeah, as, as Andrea said, and, and Elsa was saying, it's, just, it's, it's doing it, like getting to that stage of, of doing it and starting to, to actually make it happen. You, you've all addressed to some degree um, working with, with teams and 
um, different kinds of collaboration. Can you say a little bit about the challenges of that and uh, any lessons you've learned from, from teamwork? There are, uh, there are all sorts of lessons. And as I was listening to um, uh, Daniel present, I thought, uh, you, you don't have to be working remotely to, to have problems managing the coding and managing the data and managing people and the process. Uh, I, I think for me, the, the thing that really stood out, Daniel, was you, you have to have a plan for regular meetings. You have to have a plan for not very far into the process. What are some of the products that you think will come out of it? I found uh, many uncomfortable moments about the order of authorship. Uh, I, that is a problem when you're working with teams is, you know, how do you, how do you tactfully manage and, you know, I've, I've had colleagues who always put their name first because, of course, they're the senior professor. I think that's the wrong thing to do. Uh, and I have never done that. But I think that handling that question is a management task, Daniel, that I would throw in with your little list of things that you have to do before you start coding, or at least somewhere in the early stages of coding. I think that you uh, need to have a process for dealing with team members who are not keeping up with the process. They're, depending on how big your, your team is, you will almost always have one person who's consistently late with work or doesn't show up with the work done at the regular meeting or something like that. And I, I think you need to think through, particularly if you're the senior person, what you're going to do about a situation like that. Um, I, that, that is what I would bluntly call a disciplinary problem. But I think that you have to think it through and be ready to deal with it at some point in time. Because if you're working with eight or nine people, there's going to be somebody who's a lagger. There's going to be some chunk of work that isn't done when it should be done. That's where your timelines become very important. Other thing that I think is a problem, because I've worked frequently with teams of students, is students make kind of instantaneous decisions about they don't want to be in this project anymore, or they've decided to do doctorates in, and all of a sudden you have a hole in your team. That's a problem for me, is that sometimes students, the dissertation becomes less important than earning some money at this point in time or whatever. And so you have to compensate for work that will not be done if you don't rearrange workloads in some way. So those are the things that have troubled me over time when I'm working with a team. And the larger the team, the more complex or complicated it becomes in terms of each one of those problems. I've worked on, I could be anonymous about this, a couple of projects where it was actually getting work from the more senior academics that was difficult because they have a lot of other projects that they're juggling. And I think one of the things any of the people you probably get to help out in your project and co-code will have other competing um, things on their time, especially at the moment. Time is very difficult. I think it's something that's really hard for, how can I say this, the kind of people who are interested in qualitative research to be a disciplinarian and to be a kind of like taskmaster type uh, manager. I think that's that's um, right. quite difficult for a lot of people to do and, and difficult to manage in a way that what you want to do is have everyone on that team able to contribute their creativity. So you don't want to have, you don't want to stamp on people's feet too much. You don't want to have you know, make the process not fun for people. But yeah, you, you still have to make sure that everybody is pulling their weight and everyone's kind of adhering to their deadlines and things. In collaborations, uh, one thing that early learned and collaborating with Ivona was that, and uh, a little bit that was mentioned, Daniel, that constant and, and continuous uh, conversations that you routinely do, like, every week or every other week that you know you are gonna be meeting. And that will be maybe sessions that if you have a large team, that not everyone's come with the same excitement because you have another thousand things in your mind. But 
everyone knows that we will be meeting on Thursday at one, or oh, uh, Tuesday at, uh, at one. And then you come and then you uh, engage in the commitment and in the contribution. And there was, again, moments that one week may not be that much, but the next week you will come with your, with your share and make that commitment and that constant conversation, I think, enrich the process uh, of that collaboration and, and helps, helps a lot. I learned an early uh, as, uh, uh, with Ivona and I'm trying to, uh, through the years, uh, do it in other research team and, co and collaborations with colleagues and it works, it really works. And, and it works, and also it works to say who is committed and who is not. And you end up having decisions for the following project, and that's okay. Uh, that's okay. We work uh, well with with some colleagues, and for other pro with other colleagues, you work with another another project. But it's okay to understand that and to learn from that. Uh, I think the constant collaborations and conversations help a lot, uh, and, and continuous uh, for for having end projects because that's what we wanted to to finish those projects. One thing that I've found helpful when I when I'm the cat herder in particular is uh, those analytic question memos that I talked about in my presentation. Like I will put something on you know Google Drive or whatever, especially now that we were working remotely for so long, and have those questions in and allow for anyone who's collaborating on the project to access that document and include you know whatever it is they're thinking around the answers to those questions and provide evidence for you know their what they're thinking around themes and things like that and just it's a little bit messy having kind of those master memos there but it, for me if i'm the person who's you know kind of task managing around this it's really useful to see what everybody's thoughts are and what data they're pulling out and you know what they're what they're thinking might be the answers to the research questions and then kind of pulling that stuff together. So that's that's something I like to use a lot when I'm collaborating, particularly with students. Thanks everyone.